I see some of you are doing the seventh inning stretch. Does everyone just get up quickly and then sit right back down again? All right. <laughs> I've got two sets of hands there. Well, good afternoon. You're really going to have to do better than that. This is streaming live. People all around the world are watching us. Good afternoon. That's a little better. Okay. My name is Terry Walson. I'm the founder and CTO of Perspexis. Perspexis is the first vendor that... Uh, does this actually work? Yes, it does. Uh, we're one of the first people to recognize that there was a data privacy, residency, and security concern when it came to adopting public cloud, especially from an enterprise perspective. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? Well, it means if I'm a Swiss bank, <laughs> I have laws I have to worry about, about where my customer data can be physically. It has to stay within a Swiss jurisdiction. That's a data residency problem. I may have a data security problem. In fact, if you read a lot of the reports and surveys of the CIOs, the CSOs, the CPOs, the CISOs, you name the CXO that's responsible for information management within an enterprise, what's the first thing they're going to say when it comes to public cloud adoption? I'm worried about the security. Well, if I do my job right this afternoon, my target goal is to have at least three of you on the floor in a fetal position so worried about your security, you're going to want to run home and address some of it. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at what the landscape looks like today, especially from an enterprise cloud perspective. When it comes to putting controls, management, malware detection and the like around a cloud adoption, a public cloud adoption, you have specific things you can look at. And in fact, a lot of the vendors that are presenting and sponsoring here today and over the next few days have solutions that fit into some of these boxes, like single sign-on. So being able to manage the access control through a single sign-on strategy, proxy servers, being able to control the content, the malware detection in the firewall, the intrusion detection, the email management and the like. How many of you have actually enter have an enterprise cloud deployment that looks like this? Right, you know why? Because most enterprise cloud deployments look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's the rogue cloud. Some line of business manager, some department manager, somebody basically took out their credit card and said, give me 25 seats of your favorite CRM. Give me 30 seats of my favorite HR. And I'm going to access it through my cell phone while I'm on a bus. And I'm going to access it from my notepad, from my iPad, from my playbook, from my notebook, whatever the case may be. So we just heard Intel talking about all of the security that's in the center of this slide in the cloud application itself. Tremendous, tremendous security. The public cloud vendors themselves ostensibly have some of the most secure data centers on the planet. That's not where your public cloud adoption concern is when it comes to security, is it? It's the fact that someone's actually sitting there on a bus, leaving their iPhone behind as they get up at their stop because they're also worrying about their next meeting and doing their nails and the like. And now that information is in the hands of whoever who would like to now sell this to whomever would love that personal information. In fact, what we're seeing as well is that clouds are talking to other clouds behind, behind the scenes, as it were. So integration wherein, and it's beyond mashup, where clouds are actually calling other clouds through APIs, pretending to be the very users of that initiating cloud. This is how some of the partner cloud integration works when it comes to enterprise cloud adoption and deployments. So a lot of information is being moved around without your knowledge, without your control unbeknownst to you. Now, if I'm a chief privacy or security or, or information officer, and I have regulatory compliance requirements to worry about, I'm going to be very worried about this. I don't know where my information is in flight or at rest. Who's accessing it? Who's controlling it? Now, I said hackers as well. This is just the, 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 the bread and butter where I may have inadvertently forgotten my cell phone on a bus. But let's take a look at some of the attack vectors that the hackers are using today. Anyone actually seen a phishing email? Or worse yet, a spear phishing email? Oh, come on, someone's got to raise their hand. Yeah, thank you. Okay, most of you have seen the phishing 
I don't know about you, but I've been asked to move, I don't know how many billions of dollars from Nigeria and from other South African states to some unknown account in somewhere in North America. Yeah, people are nodding their heads going, yeah, you too? Wow, I thought I was the only one. Or I've just won something or some long lost relative has died that I never even knew about and I have to go take care of their estates. A lot of these things are just designed to get you to a certain place in order to affect your system with some of the th other attack vectors that are, th that are on this list. But now spear phishing is, is becoming the norm. Spear phishing is those phishing attacks but now targeting you personally where it's no longer, you know, dear sir or madam, it's dear Terry Wallison. That's right, I know who you are. I know where you live. I know where your kids go to school. I know everything about you, so certainly you must be able to trust me. They're spear phishing because they've gotten that information from somewhere else. There's the email links, getting you to whatever site then is going to install some nefarious piece of software on your, on your machine or an app, a rogue app. Like that hasn't happened before in terms of the iPhones or, or the other smart devices. Wi-Fi hacking and drive-bys, the mobile applications themselves that are now being um, put out there with backdoors, Trojan horses, and viruses. Infrastructure that you constantly have to worry about. How many people have updated Windows today? Oh, come on, you all running Windows? You updated it today whether you liked it or not, right? How many security updates can you possibly have in a minute? Those are the kinds of things that the vendors themselves are constantly having to worry about, and we are on a, a constant bombardment of, of these kinds of threats. But now, draw a line. That's something that everybody, whether you're a home user or a, or a business user, has to worry about. Now, everything below that line, that's where it gets really interesting. And furthermore, from a public cloud enterprise perspective, it gets really scary. Because now we're talking about insider threats. And we're starting to see a lot of this emerging. You have to start worrying about your users your enterprise uses of this information. Because these people are now being co-opted and asked to please get this information if you will. I wanna take this information, I wanna sell it to somebody else. The, a DBA, for example, two years ago, was caught selling a customer database. Five bucks a name. That's how much that was worth to that individual. And there are apparently hundreds of thousands of names that this individual sold. Insider threat is something that you have to start worrying about when it comes to all of your applications, but even more so from the cloud, because as you saw on the previous slide, that cloud is now accessible from anywhere. These, the insiders, as well as the bad guys, could be sitting at home in their jammies now hacking. They don't have to have physical access even to your, your premises. So you may have the best, the best um, you know, biometric scanners to get into the doors and the man traps and everything else, but if the person's sitting there sipping their cup of coffee from their den, hacking into the cloud via credentials that they fished from one of your users, it doesn't matter how much you spend on that physical access, did it? So we can't secure public cloud the same way we could secure on-premise applications. It just doesn't work that way. It's two very completely different beasts that we're dealing with. And remember that word, beast, I'm gonna come back to it in a moment. But now we get into some really interesting stuff. Who here has heard of Stuxnet? Yeah, there's a few yeah, hands. Why is Stuxnet so important? Well, just briefly, what Stuxnet was all about, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'm gonna forward to a slide. Um, actually, all right, there's wrong slides. And it's not going back, go back, thank you. What, what was interesting about Stuxnet was the fact that this was crafted like a cruise missile. It knew exactly where it was going. It knew exactly what it was targeting. And what we're seeing now is that same pattern emerging where people are basically, again, being co-opted to grab the insider information about their environment, their enterprise, so that someone can craft a Stuxnet-like cruise missile to go after their enterprise information. And that includes, again, that front door to, to the cloud. We're seeing strategic campaigns as well, where one hack then leads to another hack. We saw the RSA hack that led to the Lockheed Martin information breach. So they're getting very, very sophisticated in terms of the enterprise attacks that the hackers are, per are uh, perpetrating. Some of the weakest links, as I said, are not in the public cloud applications themselves. It's in your browser. 
Half, if you're responsible at all for information security within your environment, you probably recognize half of these things. What's the first thing that the hackers like to compromise? Cookies. That's right, let's go out and compromise the cookies. Because if I can take a cookie that contains your session ID, odds are pretty good I can use that cookie myself and pretend to be you going at that cloud application. I don't even need your credentials. You've already authenticated. If I can get that cookie, life's good. Cross-site scripting attacks, everyone's heard of XSS. Hidden field management, basically going out on the form, what's visible on the screen, but what's also some of the hidden fields that are passed along when that form gets submitted or posted back to the cloud application can be an issue. Cache poisoning, where what you think you're getting back from the public cloud application, in fact, is not the real information because what has been cached has been changed and has been changed now to point to other nefarious sites or for eavesdropping purposes or whatever the case may be. Even down at operating system or a local application level. So one of the things uh, that surprised a customer of mine in a proof of concept was the whole notion of web meeting. So you've probably used some of the web meeting um, technologies out there so that you can basically share your desktop with somebody and show them slides, do a demonstration. I use it all the time. What this one security officer didn't realize, however, and this was, well, it was a military institute, or a military installation, and we were behind seven layers of firewalls. And through a web meeting using standard <laughs> port 80 and 443, I was able to give control of what was supposedly a very secured system to a person completely outside the installation and their firewalls didn't pick it up, and their content managers didn't pick it up or anything else. And he had a heart attack. He was scared witless that all it took was a simple web meeting to give control to somebody else off the base. But this is the kind of technologies that are available to all of us right now with a credit card. And this is the kind of thing from, a, if I start blending in an, an insider attack, for example, as you saw on the previous slide, with that kind of web meeting now, I can give anybody access to anything that I have access to and beyond. All of these technologies are forming a perfect storm for the hackers. They're all coming together, and this is something that everyone needs to be certainly aware of. So one of the biggest ones that occurred just recently was, and I mentioned Beast, browser exploit against SSL and TLS. One of the biggest pieces of security technology everyone was putting their faith in was the fact that, oh, look, it's an HTTPS. At the, at the start of my URL, it says HTTPS. It's got to be secure. No one's proxying that. It's my conversation right on to the public cloud application. Well, it turns out that's no longer the case. Anyone heard of Beast? Oh, this is news to people. Oh, there's, there's one nodding his head. Is it a little scary? <laughs> Just a little. Why is it a little scary? Well, that's what it says right here. It's because although it has been addressed in, in subsequent releases of, of Transport Layer TL, Security, TLS, most websites and cloud vendors aren't actually using those more, more advanced versions. They're still using the one that's susceptible to Beast. And what does it do? It basically allows the bad guys to listen in on the entire web conversation. Even though you think it says HTTPS in the URL, you see the little lock in the lower right-hand side of your browser. In fact, someone's sitting there listening to every piece of information that you're entering and receiving to and from the cloud application. That's pretty scary, folks. The fact that now anyone can surreptitiously listen in your conversation. And what's even scarier was how did this actually occur? Well, it's because, again, we put our faith into something that was supposedly theoretically impossible. And it was theoretically impossible right up until the minute they cracked it. And so every time we talk about encryption being impractical to crack, there's probably some clever kid sitting around <laughs> in his parents' basements in between Nintendo or PlayStation sessions thinking about how, what's an easy way to crack that? And this is the result. The fact that this kind of hack is very possible, and I've given you the URL at the bottom there. So encryption is not really defense. As I said, 
while you may think that it might be impractical as the crypto nerd's imagination states here, you know, oh, this laptop's encrypted, let's build a million dollar cluster to crack it. Oh no, it's 4096 RSA encrypted, blast, our evil plan is foiled. Reality, I need the key. Here's a $5 wrench, go hit him on the head until he gives up the, <laughs> the password. That's how these kids are thinking these days. Let's get around the obvious. Let's start thinking outside the box. And this is how a lot of this stuff is, is happening. Anyone here ever heard of rubber hose encryption? Nobody? Okay, well, here's another new one for you. Rubber hose encryption was actually designed to uh, eliminate this problem, where someone beats the bejeebies out of you until you cough up the password. What it does is it actually encrypts it twice. You can give up one password and it will decrypt to something innocuous, like, you know, pictures of my new puppy. Or the other password, which you don't tell them, which will decrypt to the real information. That's rubber hose encryption. This is real. This is the kind of thing that, that you know, people think, oh, no, this, this can't, this is just a joke, Terry. No, this is why there's such a thing as rubber hose encryption, for example, is to eliminate this kind of thing. Encryption's not a defense. And I mentioned Stuxnet. This is the slide I was looking for earlier. Stuxnet, as I said, for those of you that, that uh, didn't raise your hand, what Stuxnet was all about, as I mentioned, was it was designed specifically to go after a uranium enrichment plant in a specific country. And so it had a very good understanding of the plant configuration when it came to the controlling devices, the Siemens Corporation computers used as part of the uranium enrichment process. So it was basically infected, in this case, uh, over 155 countries, tens of thousands of computers looking for the particular target. If it w found itself in a particular place, it looked around and said, mm, not the SCADA devices I'm looking for. I'm just going to sit dormant. What they've discovered now is that pattern has now been refined. And I, I pronounce it Dooku because I'm a big Star Wars fan, so it's Count Dooku to me. But D-U-Q, basically, they've taken the pattern and said, all right, guys. Let's send in the drone. <laughs> Let's go and take a subset of it to collect the information I'm looking for on my target so that I can then craft the cruise missile. It's sort of like having some of the drones that are flying around in the Middle East today finding your target so the cruise missiles can then come in once the, you know, the, the, the coordinates are, are found. It's exactly the same idea in cyberspace. So now you've got to ask yourself, am I a potential target? What would make me a target? What kind of information am I dealing with when it comes to my enterprise? Is it customer information? Is it healthcare information? Is it tax record information? You know, what kind of information am I dealing with? Is it intellectual property? Is it military secrets? Whatever the case may be. Odds are pretty good you, everyone in this room, if you're dealing with any sort of information management, are dealing with some piece of information that is worth something to somebody. Anywhere from 50 cents to five bucks for your personal information. Why? Because the, whoever buys it can steal your identity and make thousands of dollars off of you. And then you're spend, spending years trying to repair your credit rating. That's just your personal information. What kind of, what, what could they do with some of the more advanced intellectual property. This is the kind of thing that these things are designed to go after. And don't kid yourself, everybody is a potential target as this stuff becomes more and more and better understood. In fact, Google, Stuxnet, and Dooku, for those of you that are connected in some of the public Wi-Fi right now, which, as I mentioned, I'm not even going to go into how dangerous that is, but if you are, just Google it. You can actually download some of the pseudo source code to this stuff to make your own little Stuxnet cruise missiles. It's pretty scary stuff, but that's the state of the art. This is something that you need to be concerned about. Because otherwise, this could be you. You, know, you could be the next TJ Maxx. Dubious honor at best, right? You could be the next Honda. You could be the next Epsilon. Epsilon's a good example because it's one of the first cases where a cloud-like vendor was hacked so that all of their customers' customer information could be taken and used. I'm sure a lot of you who are sitting in this room today are probably victims of the Epsilon data breach 
You probably received letters back in the spring from your financial institutions, from your insurance companies, from whoever was using Epsilon from a mass email marketing perspective, and you received information basically, or a letter basically saying, beware, you're about to get spammed, because at the very least they got your email address. I know I personally got five or six of these things, every one of my credit cards, my financial institution, and some others as well. And then there's the more, I mentioned, you, you thought I was kidding about uh, you know, Stuxnet and whatnot targeting particular companies. Who here heard about the Lockheed Martin data breach? Yeah, a few hands went up. What was so, so special about that one? I, basically, a few months prior, those same hackers had basically gotten their hands on the RSA two-factor authentication software and were able to use it to basically walk right through the front door of Lockheed Martin. That's a pretty scary thing. So stuff that we thought, oh, you know, it's just, I'm walking around with a fob, it's generating a number, what are the odds? Well, the odds are they did it. They cracked into it because it was valuable to them to do so. Those are the kinds of things that we have to be aware of and cognizant of. These are, may sound like isolated instances today. I, I gave a, a, at the Cloud Expo East, I gave a, a talk that you can see online. It's war in the clouds. It truly is becoming a war. These aren't script kitties sitting in their basements anymore. These are nation states that are coming after this information. So when it comes to public cloud adoption, as I said, you can audit the cloud vendors and you're gonna probably be pleasantly surprised to find they are incredibly secure. It's everything from the user's fingertips to the firewall of that cloud vendor you need to worry about because that's the soft underbelly of the target. That's the easy pickings. That's where you need to be worried about it. So just briefly, what, are, what is Perspexis all about? Well, as you can see, it's kind of really shaded there. It looks like it's in a snowstorm, but it's taking those other two, rogue cloud and you know, utopian cloud, bringing it together and giving you one control point. That's what Perspexis is all about. And that's all I'm gonna say. You can come see us at the booth on the Cloud Expo this evening and, and uh, for the rest of the week, and I can describe it more to you. But basically what we do is restore that control point so that you can have the anti-malware, the intrusion detection protection, the basically making the cloud mission critical by giving you back all of the privacy, residency, and security controls that you would normally associate with an on-premise application behind locked doors with a priesthood and the raised floors, but now replacing it, as you see on the right, with a public cloud. Basically bringing you hybrid computing from a public cloud perspective. So you can adopt the salesforce.com, so you can adopt the Oracle CRM on demand, so you can adopt the Workday, the NetSuite, the Taleos, and the other public cloud enterprise applications, but start addressing some of these concerns that the hackers are bringing to the table. Again, my name is Terry Walsh, and I want to thank you very much. Did I achieve my objective? Did some of you get a little concerned about some of the things I was introducing you to? Let's find out if you were a little concerned by Terry. Let me know, because I'm going to give you a microphone. Let's use Terry while he's here and ask him some questions. Come along. Who did you terrify? Here, up goes a hand. There's you one. didn't have to. I'll come to you next, sir. Hang on. Let me give one over here. Hey, Terry. Uh, you're talking about what happens within a session at the user level. Yes. What if we tied that down to stricter measures around administrative access uh, on, on the local desktop laptop. Would that improve uh, uh, or mitigate the risk? Well, in fact, you know, most of the customers, oh, my slides are off. Most of the customers that I deal with from an enterprise perspective are still running IE6, for example, because they've done exactly that. They've locked it down. You can't access the proxy settings. You can't whatever the case may be. The challenge they have when it comes to, that's perfect. But the challenge they have when it comes to the cloud adoption, however, is you don't have the same con you know, fine green control over any of those things when it comes to the mobile devices, the smart devices, the public cloud access, the guys that are sitting in Starbucks with their notebooks connected to that, that free LAN. That's the challenge that the enterprise is facing with the rogue cloud adoption, is that you're absolutely right. A lot of the enterprise customers I deal with, like I said, have locked down that desktop so tight that it's, it's, it's hard to squeak. The challenge being, though, that the moment that user gets on a bus, they're right back at the same application on device that they have no control over whatsoever. So part of what we want to do is bring you back that kind of finer grain control 
even though you don't have physical control over the browser, you know, the Safari browser on the iPhone, for example. But what if I could at least control the path that that thing's going through so I can make sure that regardless of what's happening on the Safari browser, I'm not letting the malware get to it to begin with. I'm not accepting any malware from it as a vector because something else has polluted the device. So it's taking, again, an out-of-the-box approach to that, that problem and saying, I, you no longer have control over the browser, but let's basically put the browser in a box on its own and start controlling that box. Make sense? OK. Another question here. Uh, I was actually hoping to hear a lot more about your solution. You, did, you described the problem really well, but uh, you didn't talk much about what you have to offer and how it works, et cetera, and how are you able to protect the architecture, something more? Do you so, have uh, something a little more than that? Well, I appreciate that. I, I, made, a, I made a deal with Jeremy years <laughs> ago that I was never going to do a product pitch up here, that I was going to more do education on the problem than it was a hook to get you back to my booth. But, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Quick, a round of applause for that because he sticks to it. I appreciate that. A gentleman and a scholar. So at the risk of sounding like a product pitch, but basically um, we took a look at the problem and again decided that we couldn't control the client side, we couldn't control certainly the cloud side. We had to be basically transparent to the end user, transparent to the cloud. And by putting ourselves in the middle of the conversation as the slide denotes, we're able to then ensure that, as I said, we're, from a wire level on up, we can look for everything and anything that is potentially cross-site scripting, potentially malware, intrusion detection uh, and prevention. I can look at the audit logs, the information that's flowing back and forth. So regardless of whether I'm a chief information officer or a security officer or privacy officer, I can help you whether it's from an auditing perspective. So I know, oh look, that line of business is sending customer information to a public cloud. Who knew? I do, and not only that, I know who's which user is sending what customer information to which cloud. So being able to insert myself in the middle of that conversation is what the Prospexus PRS server is all about. And then from there, we can expand on to, like I said, for, to the privacy, residency, and security concerns. So I'm actually giving two more speeches, which are going to be more product-like later on <laughs> in the week. So <laughs> A final question is coming from over here. Hang on. Um, I have a startup business, which is not funded. It's purely bootstrap, but has one of those uh, cutting edge solutions. And since 2003, when I have started building my company websites and iterating it many, many times, I have been a favorite of hackers. Mm -hmm. And I have had experiences where like twice in a month, my uh, website will just go black. Nothing, nothing in it. And um, I learned a lot of things though, but I, also been quite defensive on on how to secure my site. Um, I learned how to back up. I learned how to have cloning systems installed so that the last attempt that they made on me once I finished the tool, uh, like l two months ago, um, I was able to secure and regenerate the website from scratch. Um, then the latest, the latest uh, attack came from uh, an email from a source that says Gmail team. Mm. And it says, yep. reveal, uh, put your name, birthday, um, Gmail account, I password, and the, la yeah. the last, the re recent, yesterday, um, and also your password. And your passport. And then I, the, last, the ending, <laughs> um, uh, instead of .com, it says .nl, oh, VL which is actually OLV, which is actually from Latvia. Right. So I deleted it. Bef I was already responding to it and about to send it. And then and I got a little exactly. suspicious. Yeah, exactly. get a little suspicious, suspicious because it says put your password and I deleted it. But that would have been it, you yeah. know? That exactly. would, I would have been gone again. <laughs> Well, actually, and you're raising a good point. I mean, this is one of uh, another one of those attack vectors where to get the nefarious site, they would probably take your website and place their nefarious yeah. site URL underneath it, unbeknownst to you. Mm -hmm. So when they send out the phishing email, it's directed to your physical site, but a portion of the site that you didn't actually put there that actually contains the, you know, the, the, whether it's the JavaScript or whatever Trojan horse or whatever the case may be. I mean, a lot of that goes on, and and here you are. You've already been a victim of this for how many years, and yet you were even starting to, to answer that, that email. Now, what about all the unsuspecting victims that are out there, right? Yeah. Exactly right. So you can never be too careful. Security is something that 
everybody has to constantly be, in fact, you should start your designs with, okay, it's in a box. Yeah. <laughs> and only open up as much of that box as necessary. Who would suspect so. if it's coming from Gmail team? But it wasn't, was it? But it wasn't, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Well, on that note, because we are going to be seeing Terry again, let us thank him for his customary enthusiasm, <laughs> wisdom, thank you very much. all the above. Thank you very much, my darling. I'm glad you didn't do that.